Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's Mike here at Game from Scratch, and today we are looking at yet another game engine. This one is the Echo Engine, and i got to start off with a bit of a disclaimer. When I say this is Godot-like, I'm not saying that Echo Engine competes with or is similar to Godot that way. I'm saying it has design choices that were a lot like Godot. You're going to see a lot of familiarity. I'm also not necessarily recommending this one. I'm just showing it to you because it exists. I am only showing you the door. If you choose to go through it, that is up to you. But this is kind of an interesting project that is not really ready for uh, prime time. Uh, but it does it does really remind me when I look at the code, when I look at the way things work, when I look especially at the scene structure of the Godot game engine while being a completely different beast. Now, this is the Echo Engine. It is a one-man project as far as I can tell. It is completely open source. We'll look at those details in just a minute. But what you're seeing right now is the editor. It's one of the examples that is available out there. Now, I actually had to do a little bit of work to get it to work after loading. You had to set the sprites up for the notes, etc. But here you can see it in action. And this is showcasing a few key things. First off, you can see the programming language being used. Now, the engine itself is completely open source and C++ based. But over here on the left-hand side, you can see the game logic is being scripted using Lua. Uh, so I, I actually, I am a fan of the Lua programming language. But if you are not, the actual way this is set up, you can provide your own features. You could actually go into the C++ source code and change things yourself. You can do things via add-ons, or you could actually create your own language interface or bindings to make it whatever you want. So if for some reason you wanted to add GD script programming to this guy, you could. Now, another thing I want to point out right now is when you get on over to the website, you're going to find there is a binary available for download, but it is pretty old and it is missing some pretty key stuff. For example, these uh, manipulators right here, those are only actually available in uh, the builded version. So I'll actually show you later on how to go ahead and build things. So if you want to be able to move things around like what we were seeing right here with this crane, um, you, if you want these on-screen widgets instead of having to do things at a property level, you're going to have to build this guy yourself. But there's a couple things to note here. Now, first off, one of the big reasons I said this is a lot like um, Godot in its approach is you can see here, there's no entities, there's no components, there's no composition. What there are are nodes. And you can see here, nodes, nodes, nodes. Now nodes have properties you can see down here. So this node uh, has uh, a node and a box 2D property here. So it's the ground plane that you got physics to collide with. The other thing that's actually pretty impressive, again, this is a one man project. There are quite a few things implemented here. So let's go ahead and show you a node. So by the way, if you don't know Godot, Godot is actually built on a hierarchy of nodes as well. This kind of approach of just kind of uh, composition based, but not component based that we've got here. And that is the exact approach we are taking in this engine. Anyways, a look back. Here are the nodes that are available. So you see here, you got straight out nodes. Nodes are just nodes for containing other nodes. We got things like audio listeners and players, uh, box 2D for doing 2D physics in here. We got camera, uh, lights, uh, geometry, GLTF importing, physics, physics, uh, another uh, Box 2D alternative, but that one's generally used in 3D physics. Uh, geometry, GLTF physics. Okay, I'm repeating myself. We got some procedural nodes such as procedural textures, geometry, grids, and spheres. Uh, we've got some ray tracing nodes in terms of ray tracing mesh, live 2D. I don't know what live 2D cubism is, to be honest, but we got a 3D mesh renderer, particle system, sprite, spine, uh, which is a 2D animation system, terrain tile map, and a couple of UI things, including text, uh, UI event, uh, region recs. UI image and so on. Uh, timelines, which you can see in action down here. This is sort of similar to the way that Godot goes again, where this one allows you to animate any property over time over a timeline using a curve editor. And then finally, we have a video player. So there's a pretty robust set of nodes coming out of the box. On top of that, there is pretty good extensibility. So if we come over here, we go into settings here, you can see we've got the option of integrating various different plugins, but we've also got a number of, again, this is kind of Godot-like, this engine is very modular in the way it's designed. So if you want to bring in various different modules, you can do so. This is also a 2D and 3D game engine. We're looking at a 2D sample right now, but you can also switch over to a 3D option. Let me just go ahead and show you that in just a second. So basically here, you build things out of uh, different nodes. So we've got the backgrounds here into various different layers. This node is made up of a sprite. That sprite is made up of a material. That material is made up of uh, a shader and a base color sprite, and that sprite is applied to it. Again, you're going to get a very, in, in terms of the interaction, the way things work there, you probably got a very Godot-ish vibe there as well. Now, this isn't just a Godot clone. This isn't a Godot clone at all, but some of the things are very similar. We got composition over here. We kind of got a similar editing approach. We have the timeline editor, but again, one of the big differences is this is Lua based. Also, this is a much smaller in scope project, so it's probably a little bit easier to learn and figure out. All right, so there we are. We are in a very 
simple example. Uh, so I can come in here and I can showcase, okay, what actually had something attached to it? Was it the house? No. I think it was main. Okay, so main has something attached to it, and that is how Lua game.lua is hooked up. So you see here we've got game.lua. That is how so you basically just attach your scripts to your objects and they automatically fire off. You got a couple of different callbacks available right here. Documentation is a little bit on the iffy side. We got a lot of things online that are partially stubbed out or haven't been documented in a while. Down here though, we could come here and we can get a bit of an overview of all of the various different classes available. We don't have a lot of detail, but you can at least see the methods that are exposed for each thing, which actually is pretty handy if you are doing some coding. Again, some things are stubbed out, but you can see the, the, the things that are exposed here. We have a basic bit of inheritance going on as well. Uh, getting it's, it's one of those things you see every single Lua project out there implements some kind of an inheritance mechanism. It's almost a shame that so serious that they're using meta tables to do so. Every single serious project used made Lua does some kind of a an inheritance. It's kind of a shame that they haven't implemented that out of the box, but that's not really about uh, this project in general, just an observation I've made. But you can see here how it is coded, how the logic is applied. It's pretty straightforward. You're doing a number of different callbacks, just like you do with just about every game engine. So here you can see through your main loop, every path through the loop, you're doing an update call. If you want to go ahead and run your code, you can run it right here. Just hit the play button and it will go ahead and run. On top of that, we can build our code right here. So we can do project and then build, come into build options. You see you've got Android, HTML5, Mac, WeChat, WebAssembly, Windows, and iOS. So you got a pretty good selection of build targets available there. And really there's not a whole lot else to showcase in here. So you see, yeah, sorry about my phone beep in the background there. So we're in a 2D example right now. I'll show you a very simple 3D as well. So we're gonna go ahead and open one up. This is the set of examples that actually come with it. I'll show you how to get those in just a second. Oh no, it's in my downloads folder examples, and we'll show you the GLTF example. So we'll just open this one up. You can see it actually blips away. It comes back. Don't worry. That is completely normal behavior. And here we are in the 3D project now. You've got the ability to switch between 2D and 3D. I'll switch to a 3D view as well. So there you see traditional 3D view instead. And we go ahead, go into the scenes folder, and we will open up the scene for this project. This project is showcasing. Okay, not sure that that wasn't a crash. One second. Okay, that was without a doubt a crash. Now that was the one that I built myself. So here you can see we've got a GLTF, we've got GLTF importing going on and uh, got a 3D model coming in. So it, it is pretty sparse in what you can do. You see here the, the GLTF file comes in uh, as a hierarchy. So you see here, we've got this whole guy right there. So if we want, we can go ahead and you know disable, re-enable. And we've gotten multiple different GLTF meshes being brought in and exploded. So you can actually bring in your own files, 3D files via GLTF format. Again, they're, it's pretty primitive in what it can do. Uh, but you got an idea here. You do have 3D support as well, in addition to 2D that we were looking at earlier on. All right, so that is a brief overview of what uh, the Echo Engine looks like. Let's get into a little bit of the details on it. It is available uh, over here. I will, of course, link this in the link document down below. It is an open open source project, it is still being very actively updated. So the last update was two days ago and the first commit was two years ago. So the guy has been working on this for quite a while. It is under the MIT source code license. If you don't know, MIT is personally my favorite when I'm working with a thing. It basically allows you to do whatever the heck you want with it. You just can't um, strip out the license notice and you can't hold them liable. So if this somehow blows your computer up, hey, that's on you, not on them. Uh, again, it's very modular in nature. There are some binaries available for download, but as you can see by the date stamp, uh, January, February, March. So that's March 22nd that that one was released. It's been a while. There's also an examples folder here that you can clone and get started with. Um, if you want, that is also its own project. So we can come back here and you can clone the examples from right here. If you want to get started with this guy, if you want to build it, so the easy way, go ahead and grab this guy, but it's going to be somewhat out of date because as you can see, this was March and the last update was two days ago. So if you want to get things going, what you want to do is just come in here, go ahead and grab this guy right there. So the, uh, URL there for the repository. And then we're gonna go ahead and of course go into our temp directory. Uh, I'll call this one T2 because I've already done this once. And I'll do a git clone. Here, let me just make sure you can see that. All right, there, so we'll do a git clone and then we'll paste that guy in right there. So this will bring the project down to us. Uh, you're gonna need a couple of things. You're gonna need a version of Visual Studio installed. This also runs on Mac, by the way. I'm not sure about Linux, there's no stated platform, but if, it, if you can make it work on Mac and you can make it work here, uh, and I think it uses Qt for UI, there's no reason why this shouldn't be able to be made to work with Linux as well. All right, so there we are in the directory. What you're going to wanna do now is fire up CMake. I have the GUI version of it available right here. 
like so. And now you're going to want to go ahead and find your source code that you just downloaded. So in my case, I want to go into T2, like so. And then we'll find Echo. Sure, that's where our source code is. And then we're going to give it a place to build that. So just go here and put that in the SLN or solution folder. And then when you're ready for that, you just go ahead and do a configure, let it build that directory. And now you're going to pick the version that you want to build for. I have 2019 installed, so I'm going to pick Visual Studio 16 or 2019 and do a finish. This is going to go ahead and basically uh, set up the compiler, build the projects for us. This isn't actually building the project, but it's building the project's project files, if that makes sense. That's kind of what CMake is all about. So here you go. You got a couple different options. So if you want to load in web P support or yeah, so it is QT for sure. Uh, it changed anything out right here. You could do so, but everything you need is pre-installed. So this makes this installation really, really simple. So just stick with the default unless you want any of these things configured. And we'll just go ahead and do a generate. Now, what this will do is create a solution file for you in that directory. So if we go back over here, let's go to C, temp, uh, echo, oh no, T2, echo, and then you're going to find right here the SLN file, and there is the solution file for this project. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and build that. That actually takes a little bit of time. But here you can see the solution files that were generated. When you go ahead, I did a release build. Go ahead, set release, do a complete build on the project. It takes about 10 minutes time, so I'm just going to show you that on the video. Uh, but you see here the project is broken down into a couple of different places. So we've got... Um, Core is where the framework itself is built in. So if you want to come in and see how here is the, the engine code, for example, as you can see, it is in C++, pretty straightforward code for the most part. Uh, not overwhelmed with documentation, inline documentation, but it is pretty easy to understand from what I've seen. And then the editor itself is also broken down into its own thing. So over here, for example, is the editor. So if you want to jump into the code, the code is all available there. Just go ahead and do a build of it, and you will get a version of it that is, you know, three or four months newer than the version that is currently available on their website. So that is uh, another engine for you guys. This is the Echo engine. A uh, couple key things is if you've got a very, again, Godot-like approach, you've got nodes, kind of a similar layout. You've got the timeline. It doesn't even come close to the same levels of features, polish, finish, support that you've got from Godot. But if you're looking for, like, a smaller project to build off of or learn from, or you're just one of those people that likes to be different than everyone else, perhaps Echo is a good engine for you. I'm not sure how many different people are involved in it, uh, but again, this guy has been ongoing building this guy for two years. And I have to say, the, the end results for a one-man project they're interesting. So um, it does take a node-based approach. It's unfortunately a little under-documented, but you do have GLTF support out of the box. Um, so we've got things like iOS, HTML, Android, Mac, uh, oh, so we do have Linux support as a target, but maybe not as a... Anyways, uh, then we got GLTF2, Vulkan, Metal, uh, PBR, Real-Time Ray Tracing, all in there. And a very simple and easy to use Lua, uh, Lua programming interface. And we've even got a uh, data-oriented shader approach there as well. So if you want to get in and check this one out, definitely worth checking out. It's, it's an interesting project. Would I start working on a commercial project with this one? No, <laughs> no, I wouldn't. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, it, it's, it's another option out there. And once again, I view my job as showing you things. And my showing you things doesn't necessarily mean I recommend you use this. It just means, hey, I found this. I think it's cool. And some of you may find it cool as well. So let me know, did you find this cool as well? Comments down below, and I will talk to you all later.